Greetings, ladies and metal gents, and welcome to this latest rendition of Tales, Tales from Outer from Space. Outer space. Outer space. Taken from the subreddit HFY, all the relevant links will be down below. And as always, I hope that you enjoy, and if you do, please consider supporting the channel. Now, on to the science fiction. I would like to give a quick thanks to our tier 5 channel members and patrons. Fallen Angel Buzz Killington Thank you, again. Now on to the story. Battle Trance, written by Regenta. I got caught staring. Honestly, I wasn't trying to be rude, but... Humans are rare this far out. Outside of the survey corps, anyways. So the last place I expected to see one was the bar on base. I'd honestly never heard of a human mercenary before either. Well... Outside of central space, that is. And those are more bounty hunters than anything else. I know how crazy I sound. Especially considering how strong their militaries are. But, to my credit, it's not like they've ever fought anyone other than each other. Well, not after the first time. So, you can only imagine my surprise when a hulking goliath of a human wearing some sort of combat gear bearing the insignia of the newest Merc company the Brass had hired, walked in as if he'd been there for years. Especially a hulking goliath of a human wearing some sort of combat gear and what looked like an old Empire slave collar. I half expected to see some cowardly dressed merchant straight out of the pages of our history books come in and try and sell him. Then we made eye contact, and I stared a little long. Then I quickly returned my gaze to my drink and gulped down half of what was left out of sheer nervousness. Much to my dismay, I heard the telltale sounds of a bipedal footsteps behind me. I didn't stop, ready for, uh, something. I don't know. A fight, a proper shaming, maybe even a disapproving glare. What I didn't expect from the big human to just, uh, plop right down next to me and start speaking. Do you want to know the worst part about being a human fighting on the front lines of someone else's war? He asked, flagging down the bartender and ordering a large pitcher of some bubbly amber liquid. The, um, the danger? I asked, the lack of confidence in my voice making him laugh mid-swig and nearly choke on his drink. No, it's not the danger. He finally said, after he stopped cough laughing. At least, not for me it's not. Hell, that's half the reason I'm a merc in the first place, he said, laughing more and shaking his head. Keep guessing, uh, the, um, unsavory reputation, I asked, less afraid now and more confused. Nice try, he said, smiling broadly and showing an unsettling amount of teeth. But it isn't a bad reputation either, he said, taking another sip of this picture. Again, at least not for me, he added before I could speak. I understand why us mercs have the reputation that we do, the necessary evil that comes with the territory, and in my case I pretty much earned one at that. I audibly gulped at that. Don't laugh. What would you do if a towering behemoth of a human told you that they'd earned their bloodthirsty reputation that mercenaries have? Anyways, after the human was done chuckling to himself, I spoke once more. I, um, I give up. What is the worst part? The big human took another large gulp from his pitcher before setting it back down and looking me straight in the eyes. It's all the freaking staring, he said making my eyes widen in concern. Now I know most aliens don't have social stigma against it, but I'm starting to get self-conscious. Makes a fella think there's something wrong with him, he said, turning his body fully to me and leaning closer as a harsh, unsubtle hardness came into his eyes. So tell me, is there something wrong with my pretty face? Uh, uh no, I just, um, I, I mean, I spluttered only to get cut off by the human's raucous laughter. 
The harshness in his eyes visibly melted away as he continued to laugh and rock about dangerously on the stool. Part of me was honestly worried that he was going to fall off of it. I'm just freaking with you, man, the human exclaimed, slapping my back with what would be to him a light smack, but to me felt like my shoulder was going to crack. But seriously, the staring does get old fast. I'm a sapient, just like everyone else in the room. So, if you have a question, just ask me, he said, smiling broadly, and turning his body back to each drink. I decided to take him up on that offer, opening my mouth to speak several times, only to reconsider the question, as I realized they were all rather dumb. All right, I finally said, after the human had finished half of his picture. What's with the collar around your neck? Hmm, the human said with a nod, quickly swallowing his beverage and setting down the large glass. This, he asked, prompting me to nod into a sip of my own. Made it myself, actually. It's a limited collar. My commander has a button that he can press that causes it to constrict and limit the blood flow to my brain slightly. I blinked at surprise at that. Why would your commander need to limit the blood flow to your brain? I asked, incredulous, as to who the hell my commanders had just hired. The human sighed and looked a bit chastised for some reason. Because, uh, I'm a battle-hungry, error, untranslatable, who doesn't know when to stop? I blinked a few times as he took another sip of his beverage. Um, I'm sorry, but I didn't quite catch that word. The translator couldn't pass it. Oh, I guess your species never experienced the phenomenon, he said, scratching his jaw for a moment in thought. Well, to be fair, the list of species that do is rather short. I guess. Uh, the best way to describe it is a battle trance of sorts. That caught my interest. Meditation and trances was not an uncommon state of mind for sapiens to achieve, but to do so in battle seemed dangerous. So, um, when in battle you use this collar to keep yourself from achieving the state of trance because it is dangerous? He laughed loudly again. No, no, quite the opposite, in fact. Although you aren't wrong about it being dangerous, just, uh, not for me. I'm sorry, you've lost me, I said, setting down my beverage and turning to face the human more directly. How is achieving a state of trance in the heat of battle not dangerous to you, but instead, uh, if you look at your face, if anything to go by, dangerous to the enemy, of all things? Well, he even said, dragging out the word as he thought. It's not a real trance. It almost feels like a half trance than something else, he said, confusingly. The best way I can describe it is this. A fog comes over part of my mind, the kind of fog that you would associate with a normal trance. It makes the world feel like there's nothing but the present moment. No past, no future, just action and reaction. Time seems to stretch on as well, like the world is slowing down, he said, gesturing his hands with each sentence, as if to try and better explain the experience. Now, the part that doesn't get cloudy, the part of my mind that makes me want to fight and kill, and enjoy the experience, gets much, much sharper. I don't feel pain, fear. Or much of anything besides the raw elation of battle happening around me. It's, the human said, shuddering slightly. It's an intoxicating experience. The feeling of a total dominance over the world around you in the moment. Your past actions don't matter and you don't see any consequences for your actions. He said, chuckling darkly to himself and staring at his drink. It's great when fighting. Just point me at the enemy and watch me go, but, uh, don't exactly see the reason to stop when the fighting is over, the human said, a genuine shame creeping into his voice. So, uh, I built this, he said, touching the collar tenderly and smiling, and I gave the controls to someone I trust. This way, I don't have to worry too much about doing something I can't take back. And my boss may be a lot of things, a bloodthirsty money-grubbing mercenary being chief amongst them. 
but he doesn't fight for chunks. And he doesn't order us to commit atrocities just because we get to skip the system when the fighting is over and done with. I was surprised at the amount of thoughtful the human had just put into this, but as I contemplated further, I found the single question seemed to jump to the forefront of my mind. Then, um, if you're so worried about doing something you'll regret, why do you still fight? The human's face turned an alarming shade of red and his back straightened sharply. He reminded me of a common sneak thief who just had a flashlight shot at him. Well, uh, he said, drawing out the word again and rubbing the back of his neck. Remember when I said the experience was uh, intoxicating? He asked, making me nod once more. I uh, kind of got addicted to it. He said, his face full of shame, and something approaching a perverse pride. Nothing compares to it, not even hard drugs come close to the experience. I just can't help it, it just, uh, makes me feel alive. We both then turned to the sound of the door opening once more to see several other humans, all dressed exactly the same as the one sitting next to me, all wearing a distinctive collar as well. Waved the human over. Well, it's been fun, but it looks like my family's here. See you on the battlefield, he said, turning to the bartender. Oh, and, uh, keep my tab open, he added with a wink before walking off and embracing one of his fellow mercenaries warmly with an arm that wasn't still holding onto the picture. Don't give me that look. I wouldn't be telling you the story if that was the sum total of my interaction with that human. I thought he was lying, just freaking with me, as he so eloquently put it. I was just clear enough that he would take emotions on the face after all. No, the reason I'm telling you the story is because I saw the so-called battle trance with my own eyes. We were pinned down after four weeks of fighting. Republic Special Forces managed to break the front, and we were called in to clean up the mess that the flood of bio horrors caused. Had to resort to digging freaking trenches in the ground like primitives in order to hold the line. Turned the entire freaking section into the front into a meat grinder. We retreated our section to the front several times to, and I quote, stretch the enemy supply lines. But we couldn't retreat any further unless we wanted to put civilians into the range of the Republic artillery. To say nothing of what those bastards would do to upstanding citizens of the Empire if they were able to unleash their vile horrors on them. The line was barely being held. We fought more on morale and duty than food for more than a few days, and we just didn't have the time to sit down and eat. The assault was constant, the ships were hull, and the only thing keeping us going was that command said that they were working to encircle the forces so that we could work to push the front back to where it was supposed to be. I was sitting on the god's forsaken trench, my rifle over the lip so that I could at least sight the latest wave of vat grown freaks when I saw a hulking form of the human clad in a suit of black walking fortress armor jogging down the line of the trench hunched over to keep his head below the trench. When he got to me, he took the knee so that he could straighten his back and raised a camera over the trench. The scraps foobar, he yelled, as his camera was shot out of his hand by a Republic sniper. Group commander wants to know why we haven't pulled back yet, he yelled, over the sound of my rifle firing at the sniper that exposed themselves to take a shot at the human's camera. We can't, I yelled back, slightly annoyed at the human as a laser from a different sniper melted the camera on my rifle into a puddle of useless plastic and metal, and I had to pull it out of the trench. We'll back up any further, and the Republic artillery will have a clear shot at a major population center. What about the defensive grid? He asked back, unslinging his rifle and standing up fully to add a fresh batch of corpses to the mud as a wave of Republic soldiers tried to capitalize on my rifle being down. Defense grid's only got to stop missiles, won't do crap against the artillery shells, I yelled back, frantically, trying to remove the pile of slag that had fused itself to my rifle. Between shots and swearing, 
the human said, Understood, holding current position. A short while later, the commander of the mercenaries came sprinting down the trench, as I and the human began working together to suppress the enemy. Commander! the human shouted, turning his head to look at the superior officer, only to have a kinetic round plank of his armored skull. He took a knee again, more out of annoyance than fear of being shot in his armor. Brady, give me a freaking sit rep! The stocky, scaly alien shouted over the din of battle. Got civvies in our back, sir. Can't pull back unless we leave them open to a pounding from two horizons over. The human responded curtly. The commander scratched his jaw for a moment and sighed loudly. Times like these make a soldier wish that orbital bombardment wasn't a freaking war crime. He grumbled to himself, making the human laugh once before he stood up again and started firing at the enemy once more. The mercenary turned to me. What's the chain of command doing about all this? He asked as the human calmly scooped up a grenade, pulled the pin, and tossed it halfway across no man's land. Well, standing orders are to hold out till they encircle the enemy and support us from behind. I don't like those orders. All the odds that they'll succeed. How about you, Brady? No, sir. The human shot back, leaning down and putting a new magazine in his rifle. Them sounds like try not die orders to me, and I came here to fight a war, not die in one. The commander nodded and took a step back as two more mercenaries carried a jump pack and a freaking monosword. Brady! The alien began as the two other mercenaries latched the jump pack onto the human's armor. Can't believe I'm about to give you this order, but uh, we need someone to make an opening for us. We're going to get the top brass to shell the crap out of the enemy. After that, it's your turn. Put these monsters in the dirt. The human's back straightened significantly, and he took a deep breath in. I could see tension both wash in and out of his figure in different places. He exhaled a deep, almost groaning sigh of breath that reminded me of the sound a predator makes when they know their prey can't escape them. He stood and watched as he heard the first of the artillery shells hit home, the fire reflecting off his helmet as he simply watched and waited till the final shell fell, and the only sounds coming from the enemy lines was the noise of soldier and monster alike licking their wounds and counting their dead. Without a word, he grabbed the monosword and activated the jump pack, soaring into the air, crossing the battlefield at a suicidal pace joined by dozens of similarly armed and armored figures from other parts of the trench. I heard a lot of things then, the first thing being silence. Immediately after the living missile took to the skies, both sides stopped firing for the first time in weeks. The second thing I heard was a concentrated volley of fire from the enemy lines unlike anything I'd heard before. It sounded like every Republic sniper soldier and every biotech holding a gun had turned it to fire at the humans and that they did so in unison. The amount of tracer rounds, laser beams and plasma shots streaking through the air around them seemed to lend to the theory rather nicely. It was only after I saw them touch down that I heard the roaring. For about a minute all that could be heard was screaming by a horrors and gunfire. After that the mercenary commander ordered his men over the side and all along the trench all began charging. I thought they were mad, that at any moment the Republic soldiers would riddle them with holes. But the shots never came. I quickly radioed my superiors that there was a breach in the enemy line and followed after them with the rest of the bewildered Empire forces following shortly thereafter. After a nervous sprint across no man's land, I arrived to find a scene of carnage straight out of a band video games. So many of the monsters were dead that the air smelled of nothing but blood and ash. So many of the monsters had terrified us for weeks, riddled with holes or cut to pieces. Their faces were macabre masks of animalistic terror. Some bodies were frozen in the middle of running. It looked as though they had seen death itself 
and had just enough time to realize that they weren't the alpha predator anymore before they were ripped to shreds. The mercenaries were trying their best not to look at the carnage around them, instead following their commander through the trenches in search of the human as I heard more of my fellow soldiers rushing the position behind us. The first thing we found was the jump pack, spinning in a circle on the ground as it leaked fire from a large hole in its side. The next thing we found was the human's gun, broken in half with each of the halves embedded in the chest of different headless creatures. Next, we came across the human's mangled form, still clad in his armor and clutching firmly in the jaws of a particularly ugly creature with a smug look on its face and a gaping stab wound between its eyes. I honestly couldn't believe it when I realized that the human had cut off his own arm, as even three of the mercs working together couldn't dislodge the shredded limb from the beast's jaws. Finally, we found the human himself. He was facing off against what could only have been a command drone right outside of an open tent full of cowering biotechs. His arm was leaking blood and marrow, despite the efforts of his armor to constrict it. But he didn't even seem to notice as he and the horror circled each other. Cliché as it sounds, they both charged at the same time, and in a single, beautifully executed, brutally fluid motion, the human used his handless arm to block the monster's claws, using the momentum to pivot and slice off the beast's head. Then he kicked the now headless creature into the tent. The technicians, for their part, screamed like children who had just walked in on their parents. Before he could take another step forward, though, the commander pressed a button on his harness and the human alternated between clutching at his throat and swinging his monosword with reckless abandon. He dropped the blade and took in his surroundings a moment before he looked down at his arm and staring dumbfounded at it for a moment before it seemed to click in his head and he dropped to his knees, swearing in pain. Not wasting any time, the mercs rushed the biotechs and began shooting, stabbing, and bludgeoning, or otherwise disabling as many of the mobile spawning units as they could before they could birth the next batch of beasts, while taking the terrified scientist soldiers into custody. Now behind enemy lines, decimated by artillery and the human madmen, our forces found it much easier to fight the beasts off when they were forced to defend important equipment as well as their pitiful masters. Or so I was told. I didn't partake in any fighting. I was too busy watching the human get ribbed by his fellows for his lack of an appendage. It still took us a few weeks to push the enemies back to the rest of the front, but it turned out that the higher-ups made a good on their promise of encircling the enemy. Although their original plan involved waiting till we broke and the shunning our own people as the enemy advanced. Emperor damn the sorry fool who suggested that plan when a few thousand soldiers he was planning on sacrificing found out about it. The mercenaries stuck around till they found out about the whole planned sacrifice thing, and they left the generals with a hefty pull and ranks a few thousand soldiers short as they decided to go on a recruiting spree. I spent a lot of time with that human now. He got a new arm too, likes ripping the fake skin off of it to scare newbies like yourself. Ah oh, shit, here it comes. Try at least look startled when he tries to spook you. End of story. And that, my friends, concludes this video. I hope that you enjoyed, and if you do, please consider supporting the author, even by popping over and leaving a thumbs up or a nice comment just to show your appreciation for the story. However, if you wish to support this channel, there are links down below which will help immensely. I will see you all in the next one, and until then, I hope that you have a fantastic day. Cheers.